An entitled Karen claims that I'm being racist and that I'm intentionally misguiding her in the store that I work at. She even went as far as to complain to my manager, essentially trying to get me fired. And I'm honestly so annoyed and incredibly baffled. Here's what happened. So to start things out, I had been working for about four hours. And by this point, it wasn't too crazy at work. But everything changed when this entitled Karen showed up. She seemed pretty nice because admittedly, for the most part, she was being nice to me. She was saying that she couldn't find what she was looking for for after walking by it a million times. She asked me where I could find the gift cards and I say while pointing it out to her that the gift cards are on the stand right over there by the checkout. You can ask my coworker who's running the checkout to show you what you need. The Karen then thanks me and goes off on her way. Since I didn't have any customers at the lumber side of my department, I decided to watch this entitled Karen and see her walk right by the stand all the way down to the service desk and ask them where the gift cards were. I sigh deeply because she's not the first customer to do this. And this Karen is now walking back because I'm sure that the service desk has told her that it's next to check out. But even then, this entitled Karen walks back to me and says, I couldn't find the gift cards. So I told her, oh, you just went a little too far. I said it's right next to check out. She then says, oh, well, I just asked them and they said they didn't have any there. And at this point, I'm super baffled. I said, no, that was not the checkout. That was the service desk. I'll point out the actual checkout and then you can go for it. Again, I point straight to it. Even still stood in the spot where if you walk straight, you'd walk right into it. And yet again, this entitled Karen managed to walk straight past it and up to the service desk again before coming back to me and asking me again why I'm misguiding her. At this point, I'm getting frustrated as well as baffled by her inability to not turn and look at the stand I'm clearly pointing at, but instead just repeatedly strolling past it. This time, I point at the checkout sign and then the gift card stand. This entitled Karen then says to me, I'm getting tired of walking from one end of the store and back. Can't you just go get it for me? I say to her, ma'am, I'm not allowed to leave my register unattended. And I've been pointing out where the gift cards are the entire time. But you kept repeatedly walking by it instead. She then gets incredibly upset and walked off again, mumbling, claiming that I was being racist to her. And that's why I'm apparently trying to make a fool of her. And when she said that, I honestly was blown away and could have never predicted what she would do next. Yet again, this entitled Karen walks right by the stand and goes up to the service desk. She spins around now, clearly mad, and back in my direction, fuming again at the fact that she can't find the gift cards. I am now just super annoyed, and I quickly call Sally, my supervisor, who's running the checkout. She picked up when she saw me waving urgently at her from my register. When she picks up the phone, I say, quickly, stop that lady customer. She's looking for gift cards, and she's been walking right by it for several minutes now. Luckily, Sally saw the Karen and stopped to show this lady the gift cards, which Karen bought a handful and paid for. All the while, she said something to Sally while glaring daggers at me, as if I had just kicked her puppy. Sally comes over to me and asks why I kept sending Karen to the service desk instead of where the gift cards were. I rolled my eyes very annoyed, and I said, I did tell her. I pointed out where the gift card stand was to this Karen many times, but she kept walking by it and just kept going to the service desk instead of stopping to ask for help. I even tried to suggest that I call you so you can help her when she gets to check out. But she kept saying, oh, it's fine, I could do it myself and would just repeatedly walk by it. My manager then says something that absolutely blew my mind. She says that this lady claims that I had sworn at her and that I didn't want to help her because of her skin color, which is honestly really stupid. I told her I never said that. All I said was that I'm not allowed to leave my register unattended. But this lady kept walking by before I could say, but I can call Sally to point out where the gift cards are. And you know what? If you don't believe me, you can check the cameras. Thankfully, Sally said she did believe me. And she was also on my side, saying, you know what? What can we do when customers don't pay attention? No matter how much we point things out to them, they'll just walk by it and claim we lied to them. Luckily, the rest of my shift was uneventful and I was able to leave on time. But I honestly hope I never have to deal with that weird, entitled Karen ever again. Some people are just absolutely stupid. The fact that this lady would not only walk by the gift card section repeatedly, and the fact that she doesn't know how to follow simple instructions is completely eclipsed by the fact that she tried to claim that this person was being racist towards her, when in reality, that's not at all what happened. She's just too dumb to find the gift cards. And I mean, honestly, how do you not know how to find the gift cards? I bet you she went up to that service desk and they said the exact same thing. Oh, they're just by the checkout counter. Like, literally go over there and you'll get what you need. But instead, she tries to pull this arbitrary race card, as if 
that has anything to do with the conversation. But there is probably no helping people who act like this because it's super inappropriate to make this kind of outlandish accusation against somebody, all because this stupid entitled Karen is too ignorant to follow even the simplest of instructions. If you like Am I the Jerk, you're probably going to love Am I the Genius. Check it out, link down below in the description. My boyfriend called me abusive, but then backed down and said it was just an exaggeration. And now I just can't stop worrying about it. Before I start, I want to say that I've already booked back in with a psychologist and will be unpacking this thoroughly with her too. I'm taking this very seriously. I also want to preface all of this with the fact that my boyfriend is wonderful. We have been together for six years and they have been a joyful six years. To put it simply, I love him and I feel supported and loved by him. That said, he definitely puts his foot in his mouth sometimes. I really hope that all that's happened here is another foot in the mouth moment. For the sake of privacy, I will call him William. The final piece of important context is that I have PTSD from a previous relationship. I am a lot healthier now than I was when I was first diagnosed, but I can still easily feel backed into a corner and have to work hard not to lash out from there because I believe that trauma is not an excuse for abusive behavior. So if I am engaging in abusive behavior, I need to nip it in the bud or I need to be single until I am healthy enough to be in a relationship. William knows about the PTSD and some specific details of my trauma, but the further we got into our relationship, the more careful I have been with trauma dumping. I want a partner, not a therapist, and I don't want him to have vicarious trauma. I have had to learn to temper how I speak with people so I don't come across as aggressive. When I'm in distress, I tend to use very strong rhetoric, and I can definitely see how people might feel steamrolled into accepting my point of view. William has always been very rational in these situations, calmly stating where I am relying on fallacies and helping me to define what is really going on so that we can talk it through properly. I already sometimes worry about the emotional labor involved for him there, but whenever I have checked with him before, he has just said that he enjoys that we can communicate so fluently. We were talking about this again recently in the car, and I remember saying that I really appreciated that he could go toe-to-toe with me verbally without letting me get away with outlandish claims. He brought up a specific event where he says I was trying really hard to start a fight, and he didn't want to fight at all. I remember the event, but I don't remember what we were discussing. I do remember feeling at the time like I wasn't trying to fight, but rather be understood. He said that it bordered on emotional abuse, and everything inside me just kind of went numb. I was the one behind the wheel, so I forced myself to focus on the road and asked him what he meant. He said that I pick his most vulnerable areas, and I tried to fight. I asked him for an example, and he brought up a recent disagreement that we have been having about our most common reoccurring issues. His tendency to tell me how hot our female friends are, and my tendency to find that upsetting. For example, he will talk about people's butts or thighs, or how pretty they are, and has often told me he is infatuated with someone, but he won't compliment me because he can't objectify people to their faces. Stuff along those lines. I have since asked if my expressing that I am hurt by his infatuations is what he means by picking at his most vulnerable areas, and he said he didn't have any other examples. This left me to wonder if by picking at his most vulnerable areas, he means pointing out things that have hurt me, and thus causing him to feel guilt. But it is also very possible that it's more about how I point things out. We arrived at his house and I took myself to the bathroom because I was having a panic attack and I was so worried that it's manipulative to visibly dissolve into a panic attack when accused of abuse. So I stayed in there until I grounded myself and I came out and tried to talk it through with him, but I ended up sobbing hysterically and I'm honestly really ashamed of this. And that's when he backtracked and said he didn't mean abusive, he meant domineering. And I got worried that he backtracked because he was scared of me crying. I asked him to go see a psychologist to get external advice on whether our relationship is unhealthy for him. He said no to therapy, but agreed to have a deep talk with his best friend, who knows us both really well. I then asked him if I make him feel small or if he's afraid of me, to which he said no. I also asked him if he gets nauseous when he thinks about coming to see me, or if he changes his activities because he's worried that it will upset me. And to both of those, he said no. I have never directly insulted or belittled William. It wouldn't occur to me to do so, but I have said certain things that could definitely be hurtful, and maybe that's making him feel disgusting and small, or even isolated. I would feel disgusted if someone said some of the things that I've said to him, and I don't want him to feel disgusted. I love him, and I'm horrified by the idea that I could be hurting him. I'm even more horrified 
horrified by the idea that I could be an abuser. We have since talked about it again, and he promised he didn't backtrack out of fear, but out of having not originally realized what the word abuse meant to me. I said that I was willing to go to therapy to work on being the healthiest version of myself and to trust him to choose for himself whether our relationship was healthy for him or not. I also said I would work on expressing my distress less emotively and that I was taking it very seriously. So am I abusive in this situation? What should I do? This is a really sticky situation and I think it's really good to hear that you're going to a psychologist to try and work this out because honestly I think that really is your best bet. There's a lot going on here between you and your boyfriend and there's a lot of nuance that you definitely need to figure out with a psychologist. So hopefully that goes well and I think talking to them and discussing these issues especially with the fact that you've struggled with PTSD of having to deal with an abusive relationship before definitely is something that a professional should hear about and hopefully in the end things can work out between you and your boyfriend because you two obviously love each other so I really hope that all of this works out. I moved 500 miles to be with my boyfriend only to now end up feeling like his mom and I honestly don't know what to do. I'm a 30 year old female and my boyfriend is 27. We spent the first half of our relationship long distance living in different states on the other side of the country. I agreed that if I found a job in my field I'd move to his state. So now we have been living together for about two months. For me it's a new city, a new state, a new job. It's a new everything. My job is incredibly demanding. I'm the supervisor of an entire department and I manage nine employees with little to no support from upper management. I am mentally and emotionally exhausted by the end of the day. My boyfriend, in contrast, works from home, and I do know that he works hard. However, he'll admit he has a lot of downtime during the day. He also makes more money than me. My issue is that I feel like his mom now that we live together. I do all the cleaning, all the grocery shopping, all of the cooking. When something is broken, I'm the one who calls the apartment maintenance. Basically, I manage our household. Coming home after a long day to a sink full of dishes, or socks on the floor, the toilet seat up, it all just drives me crazy. I have asked for more initiative, and his response is that he just doesn't think about those things, and that I need to ask him. At first, this seemed fair, but now, it's like one more thing on my list each day. I shouldn't have to ask him to help keep our home clean. If the toilet is dirty, then scrub it. Or if the dishwasher is full, then empty it. I almost feel like I was disillusioned by the long distance, and now reality is hitting me hard. I know some of my bitterness is unfair, but it's hard when I have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go to a job that's emotionally and mentally draining while he's rolling out of bed five minutes before a meeting because he played video games until 2 in the morning. Part of me just wants to go back home, but it's been three months. I'm just exhausted and missing my family, friends, and my old life. And honestly, at this point, I'm not sure what to do anymore. Your boyfriend is being incredibly lazy. The fact that he says that you need to ask him in order for him to do anything around the house is incredibly unfair, and that's not how this should work. He needs to be an active participant in keeping this house clean. It's ridiculous. This is just not fair for you. And you said it best. You get up at 5 in the morning every day. If anything, the fact that he works from home should mean that he should be the first person to take care of stuff. The sink, the dishes, the toilet, the laundry, all of that. He should be the first one taking care of that. You're busy enough as it is. So in my opinion, it's time to set some very clear boundaries. Tell him straight up that he needs to start doing more around the house, that you are absolutely exhausted by the end of the day, and he needs to contribute more. And it's not like you don't do enough as it is. I'm sure based on what you've described, you're already doing a lot of the chores around the house, but it sounds like he's doing nothing, and that's not fair for you in the slightest. So hopefully this works out between the two of you, because you moved pretty far just to be with this guy, and it really would be a shame if this is the reason that you end up moving back home. My mom got my Karen of a teacher demoted after she spent the entire year bullying me, all because I was was bad at math. So this happened back in 2009. I was a sophomore in high school, and this was about a year before my autism diagnosis. So I have a math disability, and it affects my ability to do things with numbers. Ever since the 7th grade, I had been put into a special ed math class, since my math skills were not good enough for the regular classes. Freshman year, we had a really good math teacher, and by sophomore year, we ended up with a new teacher. She was the cheerleading coach at my local high school. Now, I was a good kid in class. I didn't talk when the teacher was talking. I didn't cause any distractions. I was honest and never used my phone during class. I was the kind of kid that teachers probably really appreciated. Anyway, she was nice to everybody else, but for some reason, she decided that I was the one she was going to pick on. Over the course of two semesters,
semesters. She would yell at me pretty much once every day, called me a liar on several occasions when I was being truthful. She would call her previous class her dud class. And when I told one of my other teachers about this by the name of Miss Mary, they tried to get me to work things out with this teacher. But this crazy teacher literally said I was mistaken and called me a liar and manipulated me into saying I was mistaken about her doing anything to me, then just walked out. After that, Miss Mary said to me, she just manipulated you, didn't she? And I would say yes, that's exactly what she did. One day when I was in class with this psycho teacher, I had a question about how to do a problem. So I raised my hand and asked how to do it. This teacher said, that problem is so easy, even a monkey could do it. So my mom had been right everything I said about this lady down and at the end of the year, my mom went to the sophomore principal and basically complained to them. It is important to note that the sophomore principal that year was African American. And yes, in my school, there was a principal for each grade. So my mom said to him, I want to talk to you about my kid's special ed teacher. Now my daughter has had a number of special education teachers in her life and none of her teachers have spoken to her the way this teacher does to her. My mom then started reading what my teacher said to me, stating that this This problem is so easy that even a monkey could do it. And once the principal heard this comment that the teacher made, his eyes widened. My mom said, my daughter will not be having her next year. And the principal said, you're right. Your daughter will not be having her next year. There's no way that's happening. After that, this psycho teacher was demoted to only assisting in classes. And honestly, considering how she treated me, that's probably for the best. I'm honestly surprised that this lady still has a job. I mean, talking to a student who's already in special education, because of some disability that's holding them back is so unbelievably rancid, this lady definitely does not deserve to be a teacher in my opinion. And it's also worth noting, despite whatever stereotypes you want to go with, I honestly don't think I've ever seen a cheerleading coach being shown in a good light personally. Maybe that's just me, but I've read a lot of these stories. And there is that common denominator that they are just not very nice people. And I'm sure that's not the case across the board. It's just unfortunate when the majority really does ruin the bunch. When it comes to the original poster and the way they were treated, this is honestly so disgusting and just unacceptable. I mean, they're literally just trying to figure out how to do math. They have a disability where they just can't figure math out, and it's not their fault. They're not choosing to be bad at math. So the fact that this teacher is just deciding, you know what? You. I'm going to pick on you specifically. As well as yelling and embarrassing this person over and over again, in my opinion, proves that this lady needs a career change. Because yes, kids suck, but when there's kids who actually have a need, and instead of meeting those needs, you decide to bully them and belittle them for an entire higher year, you as the education professional deserve to be fired in my opinion because that's unacceptable and you really should not treat people like that. Today I messed up by breaking down in an interview because I was worried about my girlfriend's health and I honestly feel really embarrassed. So the stress began last night when I was at the gym with my girlfriend and she came over to me telling me her left arm was going numb. I then suggested that we leave immediately and figure that out as soon as possible. The numbness spread up her arm till half her body on her left side was numb. Her tongue was numb on one side and her vision started to get zigzaggy in her left eye. We called her mom, who has migraines, and said that they were similar to her symptoms. So we went to my close-by apartment to see what we could do to make her feel better. Mind you, it's really late at night at this point. Once we got to my apartment, her numbness was mostly gone, but the headache was beginning. Over the next three hours, her pain increased significantly and it sat like that for over 40 minutes. I could only watch, try to research, get her ice packs and warm towels, and hold her hair while she puked from the pure pain she was feeling. And this was happening the entire evening. It was truly indescribable to watch and feel so powerless. I did my best. My roommate thankfully went and got Excedrin, which she had to try multiple times to get down. But eventually, her pain went down to about a 2 out of 10, instead of the 7 out of 10 and higher that she's been experiencing. For the last week, she has been getting faint when standing up, and feeling some pressure in her sinuses, which is really concerning. But this morning, she just had a faint headache and lack of appetite after such an ordeal. So after staying up most of the night, I have to go do an online Teams interview with a potential internship for the summer. Most of the questions are going fairly well, and I can answer them proficiently until the math part. The stress just made my mind go blank, and I couldn't think. They eventually, after what felt like five minutes of silence, just told me the answer and we moved on. Embarrassed, I looked down at my phone on the table and I saw a new message from my girlfriend. She said that she just talked to the doctor and they are having her go to the ER for a brain scan. And I also saw that there were two missed calls. So I start to mentally freak out. 
out and excuse myself for a minute so I can call her back. She says they think she may have a brain bleed or something serious and needs to get immediate attention. So at this point, I sit back down in front of my camera, visibly red from holding back my crying, and I just can't stop it. I just start falling apart on camera in front of three people at the Department of Natural Resources, and I tell them she's in the hospital and might have a brain bleed. They let me off nicely, saying, you seem like a good guy and certainly know a lot, and we hope everything works out, but you should go be with her. Essentially, they ended the interview with me crying from stress and anxiety. We are at the ER now, and she's chilling. She feels mostly fine, so they are just doing precautionary stuff at the moment. Hopefully, the brain scans will be good, and now we just have to wait and see. Thankfully, I don't think I'll ever have an interview go this poorly ever again. They were pretty good sports about it after all. What a stressful situation to be stuck in. You're in the middle of an interview and your girlfriend has to go to the hospital just to try and get a brain scan to make sure she's okay. That really is scary overall, but at least it worked out. And honestly, I would really try to work at that company. They were really cool about you stepping aside and saying, hey, I need to take care of my girlfriend right now. This is really stressed out. They also saw you at a moment where, yeah, this is what makes me break. Not the workload I could get, but my girlfriend being in danger. And if anything, hopefully it does work out for a good job. So hopefully your girlfriend got better and everything's okay. Because in the grand scheme of things, the interview's not that big of a deal. It's honestly so inconsequential. The most important thing there was your girlfriend. And when it counted, you stepped up and were there for her. And that is way more important than anything else that could possibly be going on. Thanks for watching. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. To finish listening to all the stories, use the playlist at the top of the description. And if you like Am I the Jerk, you're probably going to love Am I the Genius. Check it out in the description below and subscribe.